Scenes from the Japanese arthouse film, Kieru Awa, Vanishing Foam. Shot on black and white 16mm film stock. Sun and salt wind bleached bones of mermaid skeletons. Half buried in the black magnetic iron sand. Care Care Beach. Sight of the mermaid mass strandings that happened on New Year's Eve, 2023. Shot in ultra-saturated color. Using Eastman color film stock. Jump cut to Washiku Asakusa Seafood Restaurant in Kabukicho, Taito City, Tokyo. Has outdoor seating has all you can drink has Wi-Fi. Has spectacular views along the river and the hosts are very kind. The camera tracks through the restaurant and the lights of the back view of a lone figure a man aged 45 with a short back and sides haircut, black hair, clad in a black Armani suit. Elaborate and colorful tattoos peek over the top of his white shirt collar. Jazz music on the restaurant sound system, Miles Davis, performing, time after time. Cut to the interior of an elevator. Six men. Yakuza. Armed with Walther P-38 and Tokarev pistols. Cut to the red elevator numbers on an LED bar overhead, lighting up as each floor is reached, one, two, three, four, stopping on five. Switch from film to hand-held DV video. Low res. Saturated color. Image noise. The doors open. The men step out. They sight their targets seated on the far side of the restaurant by the wall-sized glass window overlooking the river below. The men fan out and advance on their quarry. The man in the Armani suit is eating salmon roe guncan sushi with chopsticks. He is struck by a bullet in his left shoulder. With his non-chopstick wielding hand, the man draws a handgun from his shoulder holster. Without turning around, the man fires the weapon and, one after the other, takes the lives of his attackers. The man returns his gun to its holster. Close up on the man's hand holding the chopsticks. Close up on the wound in his shoulder. The man inserts the chopsticks into the bullet hole. He digs around, changing the angles of ingress. At last he locates the projectile and extracts it from his shoulder socket. He lays the blood-stained chopsticks and bullet down on the table. Then he picks up his last piece of sushi with his fingers and devours it. The man gets up. Goes to the register and pays the host. Then he makes his way to the elevator. All the while we only see the man from behind. The elevator doors close. Fade to black. Illuminated manuscript illustration for the new Bible, to inter a piano in pine tar. Love never falls off. Behold, boisterous torrents of water cascading amidst a serene tranquility, as if nature itself were in a state of awe. Impetuous with exquisite error hatched in advance, she concocts a cliffhanger romance with the two of them at its imaginary midpoint. He is deaf to her daydreaming. How be it then that his heart pump is now beating in such perplexing time signatures? Hold me, she susurrates to him, extrasensorily. On the topmost bough of the tree of love, a tiny feathered friend begins to tremble with delight. Men think I'm the Venus de Milo. When in truth I am a Venus flytrap. Incubation of a false reality, reality experienced in haphazard episodes of affray and desertion, 
interrupted by increasingly intense periods of hope and besottedness. We needed each other then. He was the antidote to everything negative in my life. I was his reason for living, or so I told myself. My fear of commitment and rejection was almost pathological and was compounded by crippling feelings of inadequacy. No matter what I did to convince myself, I couldn't imagine I was worthy of him. The message, he is mine, seemed to emerge not just from within myself but from somewhere outside of me as well. I believed with every cell in my body that he and I were meant to be together. I wanted to possess him totally. In my eyes, he could do no wrong. At least, in the beginning, that was the way it was. Life was merely a habit before love's metamorphosis, a condition of inevitability, but the circumstances have changed, and so has my feeling about it. Nothing is worse than contemplating your own annihilation, for there are so many ways to die, so many acceptable deaths. It is an impossibility to decide which one is the best for you, the one that fits you like a well-tailored suit. The selfish suicide is seldom a sin, it is the most logical and expedient of all possible escape routes. Fuck your pseudo-altruistic motives, you did this all to try and and save your own ass, to protect your brittle ego and bolster your self-importance, to make me into what you wanted me to be so that you could feel safe and superior, or be the expert on what was going wrong with me and feel a little better about yourself, or at least less bad. You have no idea how much I loathe you right now. All the days we spent laughing and joking, all the times we shared with tears, all those hours we spent teasing and loving, now they have been tainted and ruined, now they have been polluted and wrecked. Near the end, it became a terrible dilemma of a situation where the two of us were scratching around for conversation, trying desperately to refine those times when we actually saw each other in that bedroom instead of seeing the copycat mockers traipsing around the house wearing our clothes or watching our home movies like curious tourists enjoying their own intimate knowledge of us. I want you to make love to me in every room in the house and afterwards pat you on your head and say, good boy, when we're done. I want to remember how beautiful you are and be terrified by what I did giving myself to you because it was so brave and made you wonderful and dear to me and remember you cry because I kissed you goodnight with such loving kindness and lie awake till dawn with your naked body and lose myself in your body and make my dreams into your dreams and stop being afraid because you said we're two not one. I have to learn to live with the jealousy if I am going to be with him. Every time we go out, there is some silly girl making moon eyes at me. He is in his fifties, the women are in their twenties, most of them, some of them are younger than that, and most of them are very beautiful, some of them far more beautiful than me. He is an incorrigible flirt. He flirts with every woman he meets, half of the time he doesn't even know he is doing it. It drives me mad. I know he is with me, and he gives me no cause to worry, but still. Flirting is part of the human conversation, he once said to me. I wanted to kick him in the shin when he said that. He knows, that they know, the women, that he is a sway generous lover. They wonder what it would be like to make love with him and they intuit the experience would be different from anything they have experienced before. This piques their curiosity and gets their sexual antennae twitching. Granted, he doesn't have the vigor of younger men, but what he did to me is make me feel sensations in my body that no other man had made me feel before, that even I had not made myself feel before, feelings I did not know I was capable of feeling. Because of this, I didn't just feel pleasure, I felt shock and awe and a strange kind of embarrassment. When we fuck or when we make love it is usually over the course of the night carrying on into the dawn, and then, sated and exhausted, we sleep for the rest of the day. What he does with his tongue and his fingers cannot be expressed in words. I call his fingers, magic fingers, for this very reason. He says, during lovemaking, he receives instructions from God in real time and with a high degree of specificity in how best to administer pleasure to me, or cultivate pleasure in me, or draw pleasure out of me. He says, that oftentimes, God tells him to do the opposite of what he would ordinarily do of his own manly choosing, in regards to speeding up or slowing down, or what area of the body to touch, or what qualities of touch to apply. He also does strange mystical things with magnetism and the energy fields which envelop the body in a voluptuous invisible cocoon but he doesn't talk about that and besides I don't really care anyway, I just enjoy it to the full when it's happening to me and to us and forget myself and sink into a sea of mindless bliss. Of course, it helps immensely that we are in love with one another. That makes it extra special.
And sometimes he fucks me so well and so beautifully that I truly feel loved and accepted and can drop all barriers and show myself in complete vulnerability as I am without fear of being judged or rejected. Our lovemaking usually ends with tears running down my face, at the joy which engulfs me, and our fornicating usually ends with me saying, like the little orphan boy in the Dickens tale, please sir, can I have some more? The online questions are coming in thick and fast. Someone wants to know what your face looks like when you're having an O on the autopsy table. He fell in love with her before they met in the physical reel. Lewis heels click on marble steps. A domed bridge ascends on fluid rails. It drops down into the abyss, hanging gracefully in the firmament like a sidereal chandelier, re-entering the world below, swooping down, removing the thick algal bloom from the surface of the yellow sea, gently slapping down in mud and weeds. How long have you two been married? Why did you get married? Who proposed to whom? I feel that a great, glorious thing is waiting in the distance for me. I feel the breath of God which is holding me like a lover as I move through the timeless moments of my life. My soul is in my hair. My hair is in the wind. Water trickles off the stippled stones. My bare feet grip the wet dirt. I raise my right hand to cup my eyes and gaze into the sun. I am sleeping under the same bed we made love in last night. I can't sleep in it without him there beside me. So underneath will have to do. Just so long as I am close to the most sacred of sites where, during sex, the exchange of our souls took place. In same the way that a body in a bathing suit is visible, so, too, is my secret love for him only semi-concealed from sight. His smell remains on my skin for hours after he leaves. I don't bathe until it's gone. He can make my mind tranquil in ways no one else has ever been able to do. The ceaseless chatter of my inner monologue is stilled and silenced. Because for the first time in my life I feel loved for who I really am, not for my beauty, not for my body, not for my value as a social commodity, but for me, the real me, the one that no one else but God knows. The men I had before didn't love me because they didn't understand me and they didn't understand me because they had no interest in trying to. They were happy enough with their projection of who I was. So, why bother? I think many of the men, most of them in fact, who were, whatever the age, boys really, saw me as a kind of accessory. In other words, I only existed in relation to them, not in my own right. Me trying to get them to know me in a more than surface way, was just an inconvenience as far as they were concerned. Sure, they would fawn over me, but it was never really me as such, merely the likeness they had confabulated. No matter how hard I tried, I could never penetrate that illusory veil they had constructed around me, and fully come into myself with them. It was as though I was always auditioning for some kind of role in a play they had written in their heads, when what I really wanted to do, was walk out of the theater and start to live my own life for myself. It wasn't all bad, there were happy times and laughter and affection and to a certain extent, intimacy, but all of those relationships were ultimately defined by their lack. Lack, now there is a word. Alas and alack, alack. Making love with the others was the same, some were adequate lovers, the odd one exceptional, but none of them were actually making love to me, only to a phantasm of their own imaginal construct. They could have a part of their body inside of my body and still not be touching me, they could be lying right next to me and still be light years away. With him, it's different. Enormous oceanic soul mirrors flash behind his eyes. Each time I orgasm I keep count. Then later, I write it down in my journal. The type it was, how it made me feel, the texture and timbre of the seismic tremors that rolled from his spine and chest and hips into mine. Sometimes, when he reaches for me down there, the God-given gap between my legs gets hyper-excited and spurts out onto the sheets. This means his fingers slide through molten cream. As the full moon waxes my nipples become sharp points. He must be careful not to cut himself on them. I ask him as nicely as I can to give me some more mental bruises because the ones he gave me last week are starting to change color from purple to violet to yellow. Soon there will be no trace of his love left in me at all. Author's Note From breakfast on through all the day, at home among my friends I stay. But every night I go abroad, afar, 
into the land of Nod. All by myself I have to go, with none to tell me what to do. All alone beside the streams and up the mountainsides of dreams. The strangest things are there for me, both things to eat and things to see, and many frightening sights abroad till morning in the land of Nod. Try as I like to find the way I never can get back by day, nor can remember plain and clear the curious music that I hear. Traveling south into a blue, a song floats low and whispers through. You take me back to Tennessee, a twirl in the street. The solar wind is a stream of charged particles released from the upper atmosphere of the sun called the corona. It is observed to exist in two fundamental states termed the slow solar wind and the fast solar wind. Both the fast and slow solar wind can be interrupted by large, fast-moving bursts. The wind is considered responsible for comet's tails, for the solar wind intersects with a planet that has a well-developed magnetic field. The particles are deflected. Moreover, planets with a weak or non-existent magnetosphere are subject to atmospheric stripping by the solar wind. Venus, the nearest and most similar planet to Earth, has 100 times denser atmosphere with little or no geomagnetic field. Space probes discovered a comet-like tail that extends to Earth's orbit. Like a figurine. Like a contour. A logo. Like a shiver. Like Anne had won your star ruby and star sapphire, fresh water and salt, enveloping hug, as wide as the Milky Way, as your pair, a point. Of course this means you're going away for good, she said with a sigh, but that don't mean I'll leave. 
crazy. In that singular light, every little tree and shock of wood, every sunflower stalk and clump of snow on the mountain drew itself up high and planted. The very clods and furrows in the fields seemed to stand up sharply. I felt the old pull of the earth. The solemn magic that comes out of those fields at nightfall. I wished I could be a little boy again and that my way could end here. I'll come back, I said, earnestly, through the soft and intrusive darkness. Perhaps you will. I felt rather than saw her smile. But even if you don't, you're here, so I won't be lonesome. I didn't go to the moon. I went much further. For time is the longest distance between two places. I left St. Louis. I descended the steps of this fire escape for the last time, attempting to find in motion what was lost in space. I traveled around a great deal. The city swept about me like dead leaves, leaves that were brightly colored but torn away from branches. I would have stopped, but I was pursued by something. It always came upon me unawares, taking me altogether by surprise. I saw you toss the kites on high and blow the birds about the sky. And all around I heard you pass like lady skirts across the grass. I saw the different things you did, but always you yourself you hid. I felt you push. I heard you call. I could not see yourself at all. Oh, you that are so strong and cold, oh, blower, are you young or old? Are you the beast of field and tree, or just a stronger child than you? Oh, wind of blowing all day long, oh, wind that sings so loud a song. Harry's coming, coming, Amy. Coming, my son. Coming, Harry Pop. Coming, Shumak 39. Temple 1. C2061. Sixty-seven three. Children of the Gosh and Amy. Sixty-seven three. They're coming. Coming, Harry Pop. Coming, Strip Teddy. Coming, Harry Pop. Teddy. Sixty P three to nine. Income P wild. Twenty-six to shoot him. Come at us, please, Ari. Coming home with honeycomb and money none remembered it. Thank you. 
I am pictured at my present age, 53, my birth mother, who I last saw when she was 18, has been reduced in age to place her in a liminal chronological zone of 11 years old, positioned somewhere psychically between the markers of girlhood and womanhood. Her role as mother is swapped out for the role of daughter. Her person is swapped out for your person. I am Oedipus, you are Jocasta, but Jocasta not as lover mother, but rather, as lover daughter. You are the specially chosen object. Time rewinds with abject speed. 1970, the crash site. My mother, Patricia's pelvis is fractured in the collision. Now the child must be delivered using the cesarean method rather than via a vaginal birth. Shortly after birth the child will be taken from the mother and never see her again. Let's make the most of these few moments we have, you and I. And merge into a male-female hybrid fuckbody with two separate heads and one overriding desire, to fuse. Two cars move through the maze of streets. Seen from above, the city grid looks like a circuit board. One car has a hood ornament in the shape of a spermatozoa, the other car has a hood ornament in the shape of an ovum. As the traffic light at West 22nd Street and 6th Avenue is not working, the car with the sperm in a cryo-storage tank in the trunk races through the intersection. The car with the ovum in a cryo-storage tank in the trunk hits the brakes, hard, turning its wheels into the slide. Now, the cars begin to reverse along parallel coordinates, until, again, they confront one another like polar opposites on the 6th Avenue's neutral line. Are they bitter rivals and sworn enemies, or, are they two halves of the same chromosomal pair coming together to sire the new reality? I was a solitary child. I preferred the company of books to humans. My mind was crowded enough with thoughts and people without all the extra interference of fleshy interlocutors and their myriad demands on me. Then I met you. First of all in my dreams, then, many years later on, in the flesh. In between the epochs of dream and flesh, I gleaned you through the picture window of a computer screen. During that interregnum, I contemplated, in my rayless solitudes, the following yoked together pair of beliefs. We are two parts of a kindred whole. We are made of the selfsame stuff, he and I. The wind of fate makes its way around me, caressing my bare arms, stroking my exposed neck, brushing my flushed cheek, tracing my unveiled dimples of Venus. In its gentle wafts and wavers, I know that it is you, this wind from half a world away. The hairdresser, who is of the female gender, and is herself not wearing any items of clothing to cover her bodily person, applies the pomade of mango wax to his straight black hair. Outside the window the watchful waiters are smoking blocks of frozen sunshine. A turgid chain of repressed kisses is modulating his inaudible lament. Gone are the days when their tawny torsos wrestled in the black sand dunes. Gone are the days when you used to see him return to the village at night, the vintner's stilts on his shoulders. Gone are the days when you practiced your ballet steps in the back garden and kissed your brother's neck behind your father's sofa. A mummified cloud flutters like a moth. How long has his body had to wait for her to make her sororal rear rival to his lonely bed? Gone are the days of sibling affinities and the days of fraternal allegiances. The whitewashed walls are replete with tears. The light has broken all its vows. Blindly, I am going with the direction of the river. And this is its flow. I am just responding. And I try to just be responsible in responding to that river. And allow it to say what it is saying through me. The word flow is not me and I am not the word flow, but it is me and I am it. The language is a living organism. I know I am just a vessel for this new organism to birth through. I'm trying to be aware of my response to it, and to be non-judgmental of it. And it is hard because I want to put my own personal interpretation onto it. But it is best for me to not interpret anything at this stage in the process and just endeavor to be a responsible vessel. Sometimes it feels like I am the language, sometimes I am the receiver, sometimes I am the projector, sometimes I am the messenger. What is the message? I honestly don't know. I thought I knew, before, but now I think I was imposing my own meaning on the message, the message which is not meaningless but is also not confined by the strictures of meaning. And when I try to force it, I can see, I can feel that the language wilts, and it folds itself, and contracts, it collapses back in on itself. The words want to write themselves. 
I must learn how to get out of the way. I must learn how to stand aside and let that happen. And allow my hands to be used by this entity. And allow my ego to be dissolved in the word flow. And allow the language to be its own author. This is my story, I am, quite unapologetically, its narrative dead center, its recountal pivot point. I have pried open my chest cavity with these very hands and have extracted my beating heart. And here it is. I show it to you, cupped in my hands. Look at it, my transgressive, beating heart. This is the heart which knows only its love of you but whose primary expressions seem so frequently to be the abominations of carnality, sexual obsession and its incipient madness, unbridled lust and gluttonous greed. This is the heart which knows exactly what it wants, and precisely what it needs to do. This is the heart which knows no rest. This is the heart which is in full alignment with your beckoning spectral limb, here and now, forever, it is. This is the heart which knows no other name but yours. But how do I love him? Not with the quiet patience of a lake, but rather the roaring anger of a torrent at the lip of a falls, the boiling, swirling, violent, roiling vortex of love that lies at the bottom of an unfillable abyss of female longing. The human face is the moon of the body. The genitals are its north and south poles. His penile appendage enters the lotus blossom. The lotus blossom burgeons with newfound beauty at his loving impalement. There are three types of people in the world. Those who take you to dinner in a fancy restaurant. Those who take you to a quiet spot on the riverbank. Those who can only take you to the end of a rope. In your function as an artist, the absolute necessity of going as far as you can. To the very end of yourself. Into the great beyond. The risk is that one day, you will push the boat out, and you won't come back. My individual self accommodates various factions of desires. The desire to take up no space in the world. The desire to disintegrate at the slightest touch of the other. The desire to be a permanent object of attraction and solicitation for the other. The desire to have intercourse with the body of the other and inhabit it like a parasite. The desire to be known, comprehended, and valued by the other. The desires, teeming, branching off, branching out. The desires sired, softly softly, in Christ-like silences. With all their incongruences. All their contrarieties. All their impieties. This other voice, this other voice too. This unmet self unnodding at last the knots that no longer interfere with our wanting. Or tangle unnecessarily into a living life. But first one must learn to lie quietly. Before one commences to yearn in earnest. For the set apart sacred other. My much beloved other you. The moon lies like a blue white dime between the slanted bars of the window pane. Shards of the moonlight, thrown through the crack in the lace curtain, are scattered like broken glass around her body. Stretching her pale length out against the sheets. Papillon de nuit. Un film de Virginia Williams avec à l'écran Astrid Johnson et Victoria Brown. Scène 1. Intérieur nuit. Chambre d'enfant plongée dans l'obscurité. La fenêtre entrouverte fait légèrement voler le rideau. Une veilleuse musicale émet de fins faisceaux lumineux et joue une mystérieuse mélodie. Maman, chante-moi encore la berceuse de papa. Non, ma chérie, c'était ça, berceuse. Moi, je... je ne peux pas. Et puis, il est l'heure de dormir, maintenant. Scène 2. Même décor. La petite fille est maintenant seule dans sa chambre obscure. Impossible de dormir. Si elle ferme les yeux, il fait encore plus noir que noir. Alors, elle pense très fort à la berceuse que lui chantait son papa pour l'aider dans ce moment-là. Ce moment crucial où il faut bien oser, oser fermer les yeux et affronter le noir, plus noir que noir. Soudain, une ombre étrange et furtive se profile au plafond. La petite fille en est sûre. Cette fois, ce n'est pas la veilleuse. Il y a quelqu'un dans la chambre. Papa 
Papa Papillon Un papillon s'envole par la fenêtre entrouverte. Scène 3, intérieur nuit. La petite fille se précipite hors de son lit. Attends-moi, j'arrive Pam Elle atterrit la tête la première dans un buisson. Scène 4, intérieur nuit, chambre de la petite fille. La maman ouvre la porte. Ma chérie, tout va bien Scène Vev, extérieur nacte, de Thun. Vast geklemd tussen seringtakken en postelijn, gewond door rozendorens, pyjama gescheurd, hoofd in de war. Het kleine meisje is bang, koud, moe, hongerig, erger, wanhopig. Haar vlinder verdwenen, wat vreemd. Dan durfde. Ze sluit de ogen, roept de kracht van het slaapliedje van haar vader op om donkere gedachten te lijf te gaan, nog donkerder dan donker. Gek. Hoe meer ze eraan denkt, hoe harder het weer klinkt, het slaapliedje steeds dichterbij. Het raakt haar. Nee, kriebelt haar. Ja, het kriebelt in haar gezicht. Ze opent haar ogen en ziet hem. Ondanks de duisternis, daar is geen twijfel over mogelijk. Hij is het. Vader Vlinder zit daar, als bij een rivier van tranen die langs haar wangen stroom. Hij danst. Het kriebelt. Dus lacht ze. Hij danst nog meer. Het kriebelt weer. Ze lacht steeds harder. Hoe meer ze lacht, hoe meer ze met miljoenen komen aanvliegen. Onstuimige vlinders gooien haar in de lucht, boven de strijken, de doorns, de duisternis waarmee de nacht ons confronteert. Ze danst van vreugde, door een stem die niet meer is. Vader Vlinder fluistert in haar oor. Wakker worden, liefje. Het is tijd. Mm. Nou zeg, je hebt het klaargespeeld om in je slaap je pyjama te scheuren. Mm, ja, het spijt me. Ik ben in de struiken gevallen. De moeder lacht om haar mollige, nog zo slaperige dochtertje. Als ze het raam dicht doet, ziet ze tussen seringtakken en postelijn in de tuin een flart van een pyjama. The moonlight plays on the slope of her hip, on the topography of her abdomen, runs down her flanks like rivulets of moon water, drains into the creases of her cunt. We lie in sweat-kissed silence, wrapped in each other's arms like a single being. Our legs twine together in an exquisite interclasp of flesh, like a meandering tendriller knot of living nerves. Like a braid of red copper wire caught in the tumult of the undercurrent, still suspended mid-flow in the whirlpool's churning throat. He must feel, Buried in the hollow between my clavicles, the low thump of my heart hammering away at my breast. The pulse is tremulous and tumultuous with the rush of my desire. Greedy to take, greedy to use, greedy for touch, greedy for pressure, greedy for my lover's breath on my skin. On his brow lies the delicate tracery of the gossamer moonbeam, like an artist's iridescent silver trace left behind with a swish of a sable brush. His neck and bare chest passionately palpitate, with the gentle rhythm of my pulse reverberating in my body like a bell of water in a cliffside cave, the vibrations rippling in a resonant arc, making the water glass in the bell glint silver and shiver and shine. In response to a tender nudge of his mouth, I lift my nose, like a flower moving with the turning wheel of wind. When at last his lips touch the tip of my nose, I feel the sudden gush of goofy embarrassment and grinning bashfulness, like a child about to cry when another child starts to cry, like an adult about to pee in the presence of another adult also about to pee, 
to suddenly feel, as if for the first time since early infanthood, an unremittingly acute self-awareness and self-consciousness. I pull his face down to my breasts and allow his tongue to work my nipples in a moist, sticky, tickly peppermint mean. So sensitive, so hypervibrational, each twining of his lips a jolt. Each slip and tug a shudder rippling upwards and downwards through my slender limbs to the ends of my tingly tens, my a-tingle fingers and toes. Our breathing slowly returns to its regular pace. Evenly paced and calmly deepened breaths. The air feels slightly lighter, the atmosphere sublimely pure. I let out a giddy giggle. Why oh why, must the magic be so transitory? There is something unnameable happening between us, something electric, magnetic, a feeling I never felt before, which seems different from mere fascination. I feel as if I've dreamed him up. There is a slight disorientation as if he and I do not, entirely, belong in the same reality, as if we were, maybe this is why, connected from the waist down, but connected more profoundly there than anywhere else, as if we had been separated from each other in a place where there is no language and all communication is communion and I knew him then as I know him now. I can almost hear his own heart beat when I listen closely. It matches perfectly my own, save for the so-called flanging, one frame per second, effect at its outermost aureole edges. This morning, the sun wakes us both up early. She crawls into my back, I into her cratered bosom. Bikinis clipped with silver toggles, I say. What are you even talking about? We spend the whole day lounging on the deck chairs outside our window, sunbathed and sunbronzed, sunlaved and sungled. We shamelessly flirt with each other and are generally barmy about everything. After the afternoon nap we indulge in our mutual habit of reading books simultaneously from exactly the same page in English and in French. Our favorite way of spending time together. Not knowing why, I press my cheek against her shoulder. Perhaps to feel her warmth through its pellicle. Perhaps just because I love the way she smells, like flowers and dung, like honey and manure mixed. It's both appalling and delicious. I want to live inside of her skull. Fill my mouth with her perfume. Roll over and find myself in her exfoliated skin. Taste the crumbs of her pith. Maybe then, if I'm very, very lucky, she will let me come in her for just one minute more. That's all I've been asking for the whole goddamn time we've been together. Only one measly minute. To come back over and over and over into her, to find sanctuary and peace and the end of a great mystery within her luscious inner lips. How can one resist such a proposition? He strokes my hair softly, lovingly, absently. His breath warms my ear low. We gaze up at the lunar eclipse, suspended for a moment that feels cosmic and eternal in its ecstatic wonderment. When we are parted, such a very long seen time, I only have to return to the depths of me, that place beyond all speech, and breathe you into breath, breathe you into myself, pull your spirit out of the ethers where the soul is loose to wander like a truant ghost, and it is, not an imagination but you, my phantom, at least something of the whole of you from which I may never be unwed. Once, I was Venetia, but now I'm Emily. Once, I was a figment of my author's imagination, but now I'm that figment and fleshed and then sold in a living person. It's funny, don't you think? How quickly fiction can veer onto the plane of the actual and rupture the partitioning membrane between made-up things and the real world. I am the daughter my father had always desired, had always coveted and longed to sleep with, long before my unimaginary arrival in his actual life. His name is Paul, it means, rare. My name is Emily, it means, rival. My mother was wise to call me that, because I am her foremost rival for my father's highly prized affections. I find myself in New Eden. It's strangely empty. Just me and one other man-shaped monster here, other than that, it's deserted. How do I know it is my father under the rabbit-eared motorcycle helmet behind the honeycomb metal eye visor? I have no idea how I know, but I am positive that it is him. I also know, without him telling me directly, that he wants me to take off all of my clothes so that he can show black and white vampire movies on the viewing screen of my nudie rudy body. I don't need to think it over. I know already. It is evident to me that I must fulfill this fantasy of his, the one he so desperately wishes for. I am certain that I would enjoy this father-daughter bonding activity and that I would enjoy it immensely. 
Daddy Dearest thinks he's the only bloodsucker in our domestic clan. But he's dead wrong. My juvenile vulva has razor sharp fangs. I'm not only my mother's rival, I'm his rival too. I'm much worse than he is, he just doesn't know it yet. I bide my time. I seduce him by submission, by subterfuge, all the while letting him think he's the one in control. Silly daddy. You're just like the rest of them. Men think I'm the Venus de Milo. When in truth I am a Venus flytrap. This work posits an unbirthing session between the Greek goddess of love, beauty, lust, fertility, and procreation, Aphrodite, and her Roman counterpart, Venus. Unbirthing is a sexual paraphilia which involves being swallowed alive by female genitalia and an accompanying regressus ad uterum, return to the womb. A less common variant on unbirthing is UB vor, wherein the female unbirther's body ultimately consumes the unbirthed in a reversion shift from adult to infant to fetus to embryo to non-existence. The title, The Unbirth of Venus, is a nod to Sandro Botticelli's 1485-1486 painting, Nisida di Venere, The Birth of Venus. The upper section of the image alludes to Aphrodite's sea foam birth, from the foam produced by Uranus's castrated gentles being cast into the ocean. The inverted depiction of the foam and its mirror image represents the doubling of the two goddesses of love and the occult dictum, as above, so below, used by the deceived ones to usurp the divine hierarchy and enact a will to power, although this invariably backfires. The lower panel appropriates a section of a page from a manual for a hypothetical sci-fi rebirth. The text is as follows. In a normal pregnancy, the umbilical grows from the baby, not the mother, but it is often easier to have the host grow the umbilical for the unbirth. This is especially true when your unbirthy is resisting the process. For short trips into the womb, you can instead have the woman's uterus fill with a super-oxygenated fluid that allows breathing, or have a tube run from the outside into the unbirthy's mouth instead of bothering with an umbilical. First, my uterus fills with a placenta, then the umbilical cord grows from the placenta. The cord slides through my cervix, into my vagina, and then presses between my labia into the outside world. Finally, it attaches to the belly of the person I intend to unbirth, binding them to me. Today, after working on the, the wormhole section of Monument to the Unimaginable, I receive an email from a musician I know. He has been recording a performance on an antique organ in a fortified church in the village of Velia Weiler. The German name for Velia Weiler is Wormlock, which translates into English as Wormhole. Organ drone of the sacrificial codes. Pale flesh bunched up into crisscrossing crepes of adolescent corium. From Ars to Yam, my beloved, here are the words of flesh. Photograph of Graxel transformed using an array of cutting-edge and bleeding-edge technologies to reveal her true form. A jagged jump cut from the church to a dilapidated motel room. Two figures, a man, Paul Francis Amlen, and a woman, Alexandra Maria Grandel, also known as Graxel. The television in the corner of the room is tuned to an empty channel. Bathing the scene in a bluish hue from the cathode rays. Paul and Grexel disrobe. Amlin goes over to a glass vitrine, a rectangular tank filled with seawater, electrical cables, and copper coils, and pulls out a blue sponge creature. He opens his mouth and the organism occludes it. Completely sealing it off. So now he must breathe exclusively through his nose. The sponge is secreting a slow cold trickle of a hallucinogenic pathogen down the back of Paul's throat. Grexel lies on the bed her knees drawn up, her legs splayed open, masturbating her hairy, redolent cunt. Paul points an accusing finger at her. He tries to speak, but his voice is muffled by the sponge. His arm begins to metamorphose. Into a phallic gun. His gynocidal intent accreting a weapon. A death-dealing, penis gun. It juts obscenely between them. Amlen primes the weapon by masturbating it and felleting it. Then he points it at Graxel. She laughs when she sees it coming. A shivery titter that barely escapes her lungs. It seems wrong that Paul should have such a terrifying instrument of sexual violence and not be able to use it against her. He fires. 
Her head lolls, brunette hair spilled everywhere. Crossfade from Grexel's lifeless corpse to a television show featuring an attractive female presenter with large breasts who is explaining to the viewer the biological mechanics of the mutation process. Desaturated color VHS footage of the corporeal metamorphosis of the right hand of the male protagonist into a weapon, in this case, a, literal, handgun. That is, a gun made of flesh, skin, and bone, transmogrified from the base structure of the human hand, its embryonic progenitor, into a fatal instrument. It is with this phallic apparatus that the man nomadically discharges a spermatic bullet into the forebrain of his chosen victim. The same action is repeated three times with three different women, his former lover, Graxel, his former wife, Victoria, his birth mother, Patricia. The entry wound is small. Neat. A trickle of blood runs from the hole and dribbles down her forehead. The lesion is scorched around the edges, the flesh cauterized. A smell of burnt cinnamon fills the room. A look of surprise is inscribed upon her lifeless features. An expression of dazed astonishment. Keening of the curries. The bullet hole transforms into an anal ring. He lubricates the orifice with precum from the head of the gun. Then leisurely eases his cock into the hole where her third eye should be. There is some resistance at first, then the anal tube relaxes, and dilates to take possession of his manhood. Then it contracts again, giving his prick a sturdy, welcoming squeeze. Languidly, he penetrates the ring and orifice. Hands clasped either side of her head. Straddling her seated figure as he stands on the bed. They moan in unison. Graxel, a lifeless corpse, mere moments ago, has been reanimated. She commences to masturbate, her face twisting into an unpleasured sneer. A once-in-a-lifetime orgasm awaits the dissolute pair. Soon thereafter, our intrepid hero ejaculates into his dearly beloved's neo-asshole. He carefully withdraws, hypersensitive after the climax. A slow trickle of sperm runs out of Graxel's anus. Like a weeping cyclops tear. The trickle of sperm from the anus visually echoes the trickle of blood which had previously leaked from the bullet hole. Imagistic vacillation back and forth between the entry wound and the anal ring, between rivulets of blood and sperm. A flickering nimbus of flesh. Optical illusion of third eye, anus, and stigmata of bullet wound, superimposed upon one another. Back to anus only. The semen has been transmogrified into quantum foam. Food for the black hole. Food for the viscer wormhole. Fluctuation of space-time. The portal opens. The anus is now rotating. Slowly turning clockwise. The fabric of irreality smears upon her pale brow. First glimpse of the star nurseries through the aperture. Formation of stellar embryos in the magenta clouds. The cosmic strings undulate. We are going home. With a deep sense of acceptance he left behind the abyss gazers to vector their own wounds. In the crystalline blue desert. Yeshua radiates the victor's wreaths. Hallelujah. The mesmeric hunter has finally ensnared the glittering atom of her second mouth. He is a woman also. With her own bleeding spherical hour. He thinks for a moment about his dead father. As the ship's nose passes through the wormhole, and the word iota, written in breath glaze on the window, back to front reverses into ATOI. Observed while falling. The black bowed trees gesticulating against the evening sky. Maybe you can watch that later. The mind pictures move under their beds. I am the sound of the ocean. When Jesus is crucified. Yes, the star fields. Observed through the neat bullet hole in the middle of her forehead. Unnatural desires. Cavitate and cantillate. She must be from the sixth district. Skipping record of a voice outside the door endlessly repeating your name. Spiral of time fracture in Alt-V. There are two actors walking behind us. Chroma-heightened images of purple-red viscera strewn about in aleatoric configurations on the lime-green savanna. I can read your future in his entrails. It augurs very well. Promises new beginnings. Omphalic wash of warmth and affection. The two of us on the Cook Strait ferry looking up at the sky, holding hands, our fingers interlaced. Gauzy day dream of drizzling rose and indigo droplets. Barely perceptible trembling curtain of aetero and mist. 
a piece of the sky is missing. A cold blue fragment, clicking, ominously, between your open thighs. In high-resolution trauma. Abattoir images yesterday emit. Violent betrothal fantasies. Mother's meat whispered softly into the afternoon. The story begins anew. Repeats in prismatic variations. I remember fragments of it when I am out walking alone. Beneath a placenta-colored sky. In the moment before the romantic pulsions completely overcome me. I miss you more than tongue can tell. A spectral sting on a windswept beach flickering in and out of focus. Anamnesis. Already I sense my own destruction through this love that is beginning to invade me. Starved of direction or vector this changeless dream. The enemy within. The enemy without. This sickness governs every one of my acts. Superimposed place. Steli of wine perfume. Your cunt is a pulsing rose of coral flesh. Alpha Scorpii. So are Scorpii. Surinum Scopuli. Wet sounds. The sign of the word. Aggregate of bloodless sky. Though all my being calls out to you, I know you will not return. The camera eye plummets from the Surinum Scopuli sea stacks where the three sister sirens are perched into the turquoise Tyrrhenian sea. The underwater scene crossfades to the interior of an aquarium. The rectangular tank is filled with seawater, electrical cables, and copper coils. Inside the tank, a sponge animal, from the planet TOI, 1452b, pumps water from its osculum, propelling itself across the floor of the tank, leaving a cloud of silt in its wake. Amlin plunges his right arm into the aquarium. He takes hold of the sponge, pulls it from the tank, and places it over his mouth. He opens his mouth and the organism occludes it, completely sealing it off, forming a parasitic symbiosis with its human host. 1. The occlusion of the buccal orifice with the blue sponge drug that generates the uxorocidal wish. 2. A last look through the portal, as the human frame is left behind. 3. The sponge rewrites the book of DNA and reconfigures the living flesh. 4. Momentary appearance of the eye of Victor Newberg, Paris working 1913. 5. The corporeal hyperrealization of the masculine principle, the spermatic cartridge materializes in the nave of the armpit as the skin on the décolletage transforms into a foreskin and the penile cranium begins its zenithal ascent. 6. The incipient stirrings of the projectile tube in the soft machine. 7. Aeridopathic arousal of the ranged weapon. 8. There's no reasoning with him, he's more machine than man now. 9. Concretization of the phallic will. The gynocidal ideation resolves itself into an aesthetically pleasing object. 10. How to create a traversable space-time wormhole from the bullet hole in the forehead of a woman you love. 11. An anus in the locus of her third eye. 12. Hybrid portrait, teenage Ivanka Trump trilobite anus. 13. The infliction of trauma on the Vestal receptacle unshuts the quantum blowhole. 14. Come closer. Put it in me. 15. Oh, pleasure pain is cultivated and psychic fluids are exchanged. Remembrance of Jean-Paul, my sexual abuser. 16. The artist masturbates to orgasm and ejaculates onto an abstract Polaroid. The sperm is frozen. The image then blasted with a light to mimic the conversion of male ejaculate in the narrative into quantum foam. 17. The quantum gateway opens. 18. Cross-dimensional phosgraph of the artist's anus. The quantum aperture dilates, granting us an unobstructed view of the astral hives. 19. Insertion of the groom spacecraft into the bride wormhole. 20. Yes, the star fields. 21. We are going home. In a pink castle, in the land of Auk, a young woman possessed of a countenance of split-second beauty, waves a signal silk snot rag at a man so daring in temper as to not have a mustache on the bow of his passing galleon ship. She waves furiously at him, with little puffs of steam eloping from her armpits. She is trying to let him know that there is another mind other than his who knows what it means to be enraptured. Love, he says. 
Not now, she says. The freckled news, the speckled news, the heckled news, the run the 100 meters record news, the news who blew a fuse, the intrepid news, the rejected and rejecting news, the could have been F, Scott Fitzgerald's news, the met in a hotel in a wet dress news, the projected inspected corrected respected unanimously elected news, the news with tattoos that I would hate to confuse in the news or accuse in Toulouse or lose in the loose. What is this attractional force which draws us to each other again and again and again? The word love seems like an ill-fitting hat. One would have to invent a word in order to discuss it. I want you to abuse me with the tenderest caresses known to man. I want the act of offering your heart and the act of opening your legs to be a perfectly synchronized proposal. I am midway through completing a series of 12 oil paintings. All of them are female nudes. Each one is of a different woman. None of the other models' faces are depicted in the paintings. The only one that is is yours. You ask me where I've been. This is the kind of pain you only get to experience when you are God's favorite girl. Oh, 
tak, ticke, tick, tak, tak. Ich sag mir nicht dick, was moi, gut geklingt, was warm. Ich hab nicht mehr den Achwan. Puff, Blender sind ihr Berg, welche packt, als er dick ist. Tak, bern ich maff. Als er dick ist, bern ich maff. Tak. Als er dick ist, bern ich maff. Als er dick ist, tak, tick, tak, bern ich maff. Man sieht, ich tick die Klappe, ob er ist leid. Man schaut dich, ob jagt die Bett. Man sieht Dämonis. Je begreep mich nicht. Man sieht ein Vampir, wel nee. Ein Rofdier. Ei, de la, j'ai mal. Il faut qu'il s'éloigne. Ei, de la, j'ai mal. 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 Faut qu'il s'éloigne. Voor de klik ben je uniek. Stiekem zegt die opgefokte zot je licht. Je bent microscopisch. De weg twee, je oog troost. Vertel me wat, je bent boos. La douleur est epidermie. Le nuit, insomnia. J'ai rencontré monsieur la dick. Il était beau, il était chic. J'ai pas tout de suite senti le dick. Je pleure des flaques. J'ai rencontré monsieur la dick. Il était beau. Ik had niet met een achtwaan. Waar wacht je op, schat? Waar wacht je op? Je hebt de ziekte van lijm, 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 lijm. Je hebt de ziekte van lijm, lijm, lijm. Ik heb de ziekte van lijm, lijm, lijm. Ik heb de ziekte van lijm, lijm, lijm. Ik heb de ziekte van lijm, lijm, lijm. De ziekte van lijm, mijn ziel doet pijn. Ik zeg hey, meneer Tik, je stinkt uit je bek. Hij was mooi. Goed gekleed. Het was waar. Wat je drijft, ruikt naar bedrog. Il était beau. Tout ce que Il tu était chic. J'ai pas tout de suite senti le hic. Tu peux. Mijn hart ging te keer. Neem een tik. Tak. 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 Boom.
Text handwritten on the back of a postcard found in a flea market in the 20th arrondissement. My dearest V. On the day after the full moon, your digital fingers forcefully manipulate our deceased father's genitals to orgasm, in order that he might ejaculate a wholesomely disturbing book in your honor and immortalize you as his muse. Your ambidextrous up-downs exhibit a rare level of female aggression for someone of your height and weight and age and shoe size and social standing and sexual market value, especially considering the cosmological context and metaphysical consequence of the act in question. In equal measure of mirror stage infatuation, 
I have come to the realization that the comprehensive road safety propaganda recently implemented throughout Europe has been unsuccessful in alleviating my peculiar fixation with the morbid, arouseful curvature of your novel, Schoolgirlish Kneecaps. I kindly request that you do not lead me into situations where I am unable to refrain from raping you more than three times in a single afternoon. Because your cunt's cry sounds like a cat's bark. And, moreover, the costly conjugal monogrammed silk pillow which I purchased for you as a wedding gift has a hideously scarred mom's pubis and a vast and dreadful radiator grill through which we perceive our soft and sensuous copulatory annihilation at the flower vine pavilion of time's end. Forlorn with a thousand tiny pinpricks of eternally ineluctable luster glinting dimly on our peeled glands and on our abraded breasts. Bone this missive from now onwards. There is no other way out of this consensually abnegating erotical conundrum. I have so many things I want to tell you. I want to know all of your news also. I simply cannot wait to see you again as soon as humanly possible. Behold, boisterous torrents of water cascading amidst a serene tranquility, as if nature itself were in a state of awe. Impetuous with exquisite error hatched in advance, she concocts a cliffhanger romance with the two of them at its imaginary midpoint. He is deaf to her daydreaming. How be it then that his heart pump is now beating in such perplexing time signatures? Hold me, she susurrates to him, extrasensorily. On the topmost bough of the tree of love, a tiny feathered friend begins to tremble with delight. Incubation of a false reality, reality experienced in haphazard episodes of affray and desertion, interrupted by increasingly intense periods of hope and besottedness. We needed each other then. He was the antidote to everything negative in my life. I was his reason for living, or so I told myself. My fear of commitment and rejection was almost pathological and was compounded by crippling feelings of inadequacy. No matter what I did to convince myself, I couldn't imagine I was worthy of him. The message, he is mine, seemed to emerge not just from within myself but from somewhere outside of me as well. I believed with every cell in my body that he and I were meant to be together. I wanted to possess him totally. In my eyes, he could do no wrong. At least, in the beginning, that was the way it was. Life was merely a habit before love's metamorphosis, a condition of inevitability, but the circumstances have changed, and so has my feeling about it. Nothing is worse than contemplating your own annihilation, for there are so many ways to die, so many acceptable deaths. It is an impossibility to decide which one is the best for you, the one that fits you like a well-tailored suit. The selfish suicide is seldom a sin, it is the most logical and expedient of all possible escape routes. Fuck your pseudo-altruistic motives, you did this all to try and and save your own ass, to protect your brittle ego and bolster your self-importance, to make me into what you wanted me to be so that you could feel safe and superior, or be the expert on what was going wrong with me and feel a little better about yourself, or at least less bad. You have no idea how much I loathe you right now. All the days we spent laughing and joking, all the times we shared with tears, all those hours we spent teasing and loving, now they have been tainted and ruined, now they have been polluted and wrecked. Near the end, it became a terrible dilemma of a situation where the two of us were scratching around for conversation, trying desperately to refine those times when we actually saw each other in that bedroom instead of seeing the copycat mockers traipsing around the house wearing our clothes or watching our home movies like curious tourists enjoying their own intimate knowledge of us. I want you to make love to me in every room in the house and afterwards pat you on your head and say, good boy, when we're done. I want to remember how beautiful you are and be terrified by what I did giving myself to you because it was so brave and made you wonderful and dear to me and remember you cry because I kissed you goodnight with such loving kindness and lie awake till dawn with your naked body and lose myself in your body and make my dreams into your dreams and stop being afraid because you said we're two not one. I have to learn to live with the jealousy if I am going to be with him. Every time we go out, there is some silly girl making moon eyes at him. He is in his fifties, the women are in their twenties, most of them, some of them are younger than that, and most of them are very beautiful, some of them far more beautiful than me. He is an incorrigible flirt. He flirts with every woman he meets, half of the time he doesn't even know he is doing it. It drives me mad. I know he is with me, and he gives me no cause to worry, but still. Flirting is part of the human conversation, he once said to me. I wanted to kick him in the shin when he said that. He knows, that they know, the women, that he is a sway generous lover. 
They wonder what it would be like to make love with him and they intuit the experience would be different from anything they have experienced before. This piques their curiosity and gets their sexual antennae twitching. Granted, he doesn't have the vigor of younger men, but what he did to me is make me feel sensations in my body that no other man had made me feel before, that even I had not made myself feel before, feelings I did not know I was capable of feeling. Because of this, I didn't just feel pleasure, I felt shock and awe and a strange kind of embarrassment. When we fuck or when we make love it is usually over the course of the night carrying on into the dawn, and then, sated and exhausted, we sleep for the rest of the day. What he does with his tongue and his fingers cannot be expressed in words. I call his fingers, magic fingers, for this very reason. He says, during lovemaking, he receives instructions from God, in real time and with a high degree of specificity in how best to administer pleasure to me, or cultivate pleasure in me, or draw pleasure out of me. He says, that oftentimes, God tells him to do the opposite of what he would ordinarily do of his own manly choosing, in regards to speeding up or slowing down, or what area of the body to touch, or what qualities of touch to apply. He also does strange mystical things with magnetism and the energy fields which envelop the body in an voluptuous invisible cocoon but he doesn't talk about that and besides I don't really care anyway, I just enjoy it to the full when it's happening to me and to us and forget myself and sink into a sea of mindless bliss. Of course, it helps immensely that we are in love with one another. That makes it extra special. And sometimes he fucks me so well and so beautifully that I truly feel loved and accepted and can drop all barriers and show myself in complete vulnerability as I am without fear of being judged or rejected. Our lovemaking usually ends with tears running down my face, at the joy which engulfs me, and our fornicating usually ends with me saying, like the little orphan boy in the Dickens tale, please sir, can I have some more? The online questions are coming in thick and fast. Someone wants to know what your face looks like when you're having an O on the autopsy table. He fell in love with her before they met in the physical reel. Lewis heels click on marble steps. A domed bridge ascends on fluid rails. It drops down into the abyss, hanging gracefully in the firmament like a sidereal chandelier, re-entering the world below, swooping down, removing the thick algal bloom from the surface of the yellow sea, gently slapping down in mud and weeds. How long have you two been married? Why did you get married? Who proposed to whom? I feel that a great, glorious thing is waiting in the distance for me. I feel the breath of God which is holding me like a lover as I move through the timeless moments of my life. My soul is in my hair. My hair is in the wind. Water trickles off the stippled stones. My bare feet grip the wet dirt. I raise my right hand to cup my eyes and gaze into the sun. I am sleeping under the same bed we made love in last night. I can't sleep in it without him there beside me. So underneath will have to do. Just so long as I am close to the most sacred of sites where, during sex, the exchange of our souls took place. In same the way that a body in a bathing suit is visible, so, too, is my secret love for him only semi-concealed from sight. His smell remains on my skin for hours after he leaves. I don't bathe until it's gone. He can make my mind tranquil in ways no one else has ever been able to do. The ceaseless chatter of my inner monologue is stilled and silenced. Because for the first time in my life I feel loved for who I really am, not for my beauty, not for my body, not for my value as a social commodity, but for me, the real me, the one that no one else but God knows. The men I had before didn't love me because they didn't understand me and they didn't understand me because they had no interest in trying to. They were happy enough with their projection of who I was. So, why bother? I think many of the men, most of them in fact, who were, whatever the age, boys really, saw me as a kind of accessory. In other words, I only existed in relation to them, not in my own right. Me trying to get them to know me in a more than surface way, was just an inconvenience as far as they were concerned. Sure, they would fawn over me, but it was never really me as such, merely the likeness they had confabulated. No matter how hard I tried, I could never penetrate that illusory veil they had constructed around me, and fully come into myself with them. It was as though I was always auditioning for some kind of role in a play they had written in their heads, when what I really wanted to do, was walk out of the theater and start to live my own life for myself. It wasn't all bad, there were happy times and laughter and affection and to a certain extent, intimacy, 
but all of those relationships were ultimately defined by their lack. Lack, now there is a word. Alas and alack, alack. Making love with the others was the same, some were adequate lovers, the odd one exceptional, but none of them were actually making love to me, only to a phantasm of their own imaginal construct. They could have a part of their body inside of my body and still not be touching me, they could be lying right next to me and still be light years away. With him, it's different. Enormous oceanic soul mirrors flash behind his eyes. Each time I orgasm I keep count. Then later, I write it down in my journal. The type it was, how it made me feel, the texture and timbre of the seismic tremors that rolled from his spine and chest and hips into mine. Sometimes, when he reaches for me down there, the god-given gap between my legs gets hyper-excited and spurts out onto the sheets. This means his fingers slide through molten cream. As the full moon waxes my nipples become sharp points. He must be careful not to cut himself on them. I ask him as nicely as I can to give me some more mental bruises because the ones he gave me last week are starting to change color from purple to violet to yellow. Soon there will be no trace of his love left in me at all. They move together, intertwined. His movements are the mirror of hers, they always coincide. When she raises her hips slightly, so that his penis goes deeper, he smiles, bowing his forehead, offering himself. There, little one, it's your turn now. The universe obliges him, in good faith, to make his first obeisance. And he, submissive before mother nature, agrees, since his body has no other intention than to plunder and sunder her. Divine daughter has two men in one, a double rape. The father she adores and the father she despises. She can never choose between them. Daddy darling rapes her more deeply than anyone else ever has. No trace remains in her memory or imagination of any other ravisher of womanhood other than him. He breaks down her resistance completely. And yet at the same time, he must surrender completely. The harmony between her and him is mirror reversed. For her, surrender means extreme rigidity, for him, it means extreme softness. He holds her a long time, very long after her body relaxes, cradling her, caressing her, soothing her. He kisses her like a child, kisses her eyes, kisses her nose, kisses her mouth, kisses her ears, kisses her everywhere, kisses her on and on. And, within himself, he feels that while he is kissing her, he is also slowly leaving her, each kiss releasing something that keeps them tangled and bound. Her head is resting on his chest. But she cannot hear his heart beat. And though she would like to lie with him for a while longer and take pleasure from the contentment she finds in his arms, she knows that this is not permitted. The incipient urge she feels must be denied, or else they will not be able to continue on as lovers. They cannot grow too close. If they did then could she allow herself to be taken again without feeling repulsion? She wanted nothing from him except a return to the condition of absolute powerlessness. He was sensitive enough to pick up on her unvoiced needs. And so he turned her over onto her stomach, pinned her to the bed, and pierced her through again. Her voice, in time with his rough thrusts, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You're lying next to me in bed. No, please don't talk. I'm aware of your desires. Poor little boy. Poor sad boy. I know what you want from me. You want me to save you. It's as simple as that. All I need to do is open my legs. And let you violate me however you wish. And your Lord Jesus will weep over our naked bodies while you are fucking me. The lover's gaze is the gentlest of all caresses or else it is the most brutal of violent blows. Oh, your azure eyes, eyes ringed with sapphire at the outermost edges, eyes streaked with scintilla of green and hazel, imploring eyes, implacable eyes, inexorable eyes. They flash out sparks, set alight the sky, they wick up the stars. Why do you keep looking at me like that? Don't ask for more than what I can give you. Let it be enough to look but not touch. What's so great about a piece of S anyway? Everyone has one, even me. In fact, it's my best friend. One cheek is named, the Whore of Babylon, the other one, I forget. What would you call her? Yes, that's right. The Virgin of Seville. 
They're two sides of the same coin. Your face betrays you when I say that. Does it excite you? The thought of watching your mother get fucked in the ass by me wearing a strap-on made from your amputated, plastinated prick. Bugger me by force if you must, but spare me the affront of worshipping me. No more poems. No more entreaties. What makes you think you could ever master me? Even if you did, what guarantee would you have of pleasure, after I acquiesce to your will? You'd likely lose interest in me right away. Stop, give up on your folly. It hurts me greatly to see how you yearn for what you will never possess. They told me all about you. They warned me that you had violent tendencies, but I paid them no mind, even though I believed them. The rumors only turned me on. So why are you so gentle with me? I'm not a porcelain doll, I won't break if you embrace me. Take your father's revolver and press it against the side of my head while you finger fuck me. Better still, shove it up my ass. Lead me through the forest of black pine trees in the attic where I pine for you. Douse me with petrol and set me alight. I'm not afraid of you. I want to see the monster that lives inside of you. I want it to come out so that I may conquer it, and in doing so, truly feel and come into and inhabit my womanly power. Dawn at Wellington Airport. Tankers with flashing orange lights move like white metal beetles across the runway. Planes taxi by. The hills form a natural bowl around the airport like a gladiatorial arena. A white Kourou symbol is painted on a black background on the tail of the aircraft. Birds swoop in low. The sky is a brooding leaden gray with a tinge of blue that is almost gray as well. Noise of coffee maker to my left. Cafe worker calling out, order for Victoria, to my right. Strains of execrable pop music leaking out of the sound system, Shakira, I think. I am waiting for him. Where on earth is he? He said he'd be here to meet me on arrival. An odd, yet somehow a name, couple, is seated at the table next to mine. They are an entirely different species to my own, or at the very least, members of a rare subspecies. They are wearers of strange flesh. Some hybrid strain of human alien life form, by the looks of it. Like bear bugs with mastic eyes. The female has, in place of a mouth, a profusion of slimy, pink tendrils. The tentacles gesticulate like a sea anemone being poured through by an incoming surge of tide. They move at a dilatory tempo, not quite hypnotical in their aspect, but certainly suggestive, in a faintly obscene way. He wants to break it off. He says he is too old for me and that I should be with someone closer to my own age. He says I should experience life as a young person's adventure without him around to restrict me with his old person ways. When he tells me this I am totally dumbstruck. I honestly didn't see it coming. I harbored, and nursed, a fear in my breast which was connected to the idea of him abandoning me, but I never thought that fear would bloom into a full-fledged reality as quickly as has done. I compose a letter for him and tuck it under his apartment door. My love. I reject your offer. I do not want to be released. For all your years and all of your amassed accumulated wisdom, there is still so much you do not know. You do not understand the soul of a woman. I am not some bond slave concubine that can be dismissed with a wave of the hand. I am not a pet you can send away to live on the farm. Nor am I an automaton with no mind or will of its own. Your gesture is dressed in nobility, in altruism, but beneath the surface, it reeks of cowardice. I know you will find this hard to accept, but I have never felt more free than I do now. I have never felt more myself than when I am with you. I am no longer concerned with the needs and wants and demands of my ego. I am awakened to something beyond myself by this passion for you. I am not going anywhere. I understand the psychological underpinnings of your Komaharaga Wakemare games. I understand why it is that you act that way and how it all came about. For all your Byzantine complexities, you are very much a simple person. Almost like a child. I don't mean that as an insult, I love that about you. I covet your intimacy, your presence, your approval, your energy, and yes, your love as well, even if I do this by challenging you. I do not wish to part from you. In fact, such a thing would be impossible for me. I am not too proud to say it. Nor do I see that as a weakness. I know you are afraid, I am as well, but I need you to be strong for me. Be with me, be mine, until the end, and ever after. 
with tender affection, mad passion, and undying devotion. In the moment before life is breathed into a child, God's heartbeat stops. Then it starts again. A man who is alone is different, self-contained, self-sufficient. A man who is alone might even chose to be an island. A girl cannot be an island. She can be the ocean sloshing about over the face of the earth or the sky in a state of terminal velocity freefall, but never an island. A girl who is alone is always the missing part of a couple. A man who is alone is never alone. He is always with himself, and that is company enough for him, if he is truly a man. The journal is an experiment to divine what it is that I am actually feeling. A reader might say, well of course you know, you don't need to write it down to know, you know already. But if he or she had said that to me, I would have said no, because at the moment I do not know. To understand myself I must give my mind a kind of exercise and write it all down. If I knew better how to live in the world, then the writing would be unnecessary. I wouldn't need write these things down, but now that they come upon me, the indistinct, unreadable feelings, and now I have the writing to deploy as an analytical instrument, I must make good use of it. To untangle myself from myself. To pick the lock of myself and open the cage of myself. They are important, the words, for what they teach me about me, and maybe what they teach you about you, whoever it is you are. They are almost like symptoms of a not yet caught disease, the shadow of something yet to happen, a foreboding silhouette of futurity slowly encroaching on the present, stretching its arms across time to meet us, the writer, the reader, and their shared, reciprocal fate. Faithfully, I remain, yours, V. Oh, si nous mourons, 